Hey everyone, it's a beautiful Friday and this is Locked On Sports Minnesota. I'm your host, Ron Johnson, and this is The Roundtable. Today's guests, or villains, I guess we'll call them today, we got Luke Spinman as the villain. We got Sam Ekstrom as the hero, and we got Brandon Warren as just the, the guy that has to pick a side. And Brandon Warren is going to join us from Locked On Twins. We want to thank you for joining us on the roundtable. And of course, I'm Ron Johnson. And we want everybody to know this episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Just go to fanduel.com backslash locked on to make every moment more. And maybe Brandon, his talks today about the Twins might help you guys figure out what money to put on the Twins because uh, the bats came alive a little bit, and we'll talk about that. But coming up today's topics, fellas, we got to get locked in because there's a lot of stuff going on in sports. What you got for me today, Luke? Yeah, Ron, the ESPYs are coming up. Justin Jefferson is up for not one but two awards. We'll break down his chances at coming home with some hardware coming up next. And the Timberwolves last night making a big move. Did the San Antonio Spurs make a huge mistake? And no, I don't mean Wemby. I mean allowing the Wolves to swoop in and take a future all-star in Leonard Miller. Joe Ryan had a three-hit shutout in the series finale against the Red Sox. A good hitting team, I might add. This could be a springboard for the Twins, but do we really think it's going to be? Well, when you look at Dalvin Cook, he hasn't found a team just yet. He did have some comments on a recent podcast with Adam Schefter. We're going to dive into one of them because the math is not math. And as I love to say, when you do the math of what he wants, but with the math of where he can go, the two don't really add up. But there is one team, one team that could make it work. But do they want to spend that money on a running back to win a Super Bowl now? We'll talk about that next on the Friday Roundtable. But, fellas, here we go. Let's jump into this one. We don't really understand what's going on around the world with sports, but the fun stuff of sports is starting to come because baseball season, we know in October they're going to come to an end. Football season is just getting going. But ESPN loves to do some stuff. So, Luke, drop it on us, man. Yeah, it's that time of the year, guys. The ESPYs right around the corner coming up July 12th. And wouldn't you know it, Justin Jefferson is up for not one but two ESPYs, one for best NFL player, the other for best play of the year, of course, talking about the catcher around the world, coming down with that one-hander in Buffalo in Week 10 last season. Uh, look, as far as the NFL player of the year goes, it's very similar to the MVP. Unless you're a quarterback, it's so tough to win this thing. Seven of the eight last winners have all been quarterbacks. So it's going to be tough for J.J. to come home with the hardware on that one. Having said that, just last year, Cooper Cup did win it after that Triple Crown season. Now, we'll say Cup's 2021 season was one of the greatest we've ever seen from a wideout. And as great as J.J.'s stats were last year, Cup did have more receptions, more yards, and more touchdowns. So it's going to be awfully tough. If I was a betting man, I'd probably go chalk and pick Patrick Mahomes. But you never know. Maybe J.J. can make it back-to-back -back years. A wide receiver is selected. Uh, fun fact, by the way, who's the last Viking to win an SB? Anyone want to take a guess? Greg Lewis. Oh, good guess. Good guess. That is not it. That I was going to say it. Adrian Peterson, maybe? AP, 2013, after that MVP season, he won this award. End of the day, though, guys, I think he's got better odds to win it for the play of the year. Here's the quick competition. Michael Block, hole in one, 2023 PGA Championship. Florida gymnast Trinity Thompson scored a perfect 10, tied the NCAA record. And Ali Lamos with the perfect corner kick leading to the tie-in NCAA Women's National Championship game. Of those four, I think JJ's got a better shot to win play of the year. What do you guys think? Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. Now, if it's player of the year, if we're basing it on what happened last season, I think Mahomes, by virtue of not only winning a Super Bowl, but gutting it out those playoffs through injury at the most important position in football, I think Mahomes probably gets my vote there, uh, as good as Jefferson was. But the best play, it's got to be J.J. Now, granted, I haven't seen two of these. I haven't seen Ali Lemos's corner kick, and I haven't seen Trinity Thomas's routine. But I tell you what, Justin Jefferson's catch, considering the stakes, considering what it represented at the time uh, to help you know win a game on the road, to go up and get it like he did, uh, to, to get on the highlight reels forever, I feel like Jefferson's got to win this contest. The hole-in-one by block was heartwarming and cool, but it didn't really mean anything in terms of that tournament. He was just kind of a fun story, so I, I got to go Jefferson all the way. Yeah, and I'm right in lockstep with you guys there. I think Jefferson's chances are way better on play of the year. The only 
chance that I think anybody else has of winning it is if there's Mahomes fatigue, because mm. we've seen that in uh, Major League Baseball with Mike Trout. You know, you almost feel like Mike Trout is so good. He doesn't need the MVP. So they give it to Miguel Cabrera, who had the triple crown and et cetera. And so if there's Mahomes fatigue, maybe then you can go to Hertz, maybe Bosa. I mean, Bosa was absolutely phenomenal, but I just don't like JJ's chances here and it would be great if he brought it home also too with the play of the year it's one of the it's top two top three plays i've ever seen i'm thinking like the obj catch down the sideline like same vein there just an absolutely incredible play so i think you guys are exactly right play of the year for sure but i don't like the chances for uh player of the year Here's the thing I go about stats. Honestly, it's going to be a Patrick Mahomes day. He won the Super Bowl. Uh, and then if you think about this, Jalen Hurts, because I was trying to do the whole math of, of what could happen. Jalen Hurts, 35 total touchdowns. He had 35 total touchdowns, and he had 4,400 total yards because let's not forget the man had 760 on the ground. So he did do something very elite, 13 touchdowns rushing, elite. But here's the problem. Patrick Mahomes had 5,200 yards just passing. So you can throw in Patrick Mahomes' little scrambles here and there. Uh, same with his total touchdowns. 41 are just with his arm. So Patrick Mahomes did something this year where he put the team on his back. So it's going to go to Patrick Mahomes. I mean, unless the voters are just, like, sick of Brittany Mahomes and, and, and Jackson Mahomes, and they're like, look, I don't want anything else Mahomes around us right now. That's the only thing I could see knocking Patrick Mahomes down is his family giving him a negative because they're tired of seeing them celebrate. But other than that, the man was outstanding, 5,200 yards, 41 freaking touchdowns. Like, come on, 41 touchdowns? Like, that's where you're just elite. Jalen Hurts would be next. My guess is, and they'll bring this up or something, Justin Jefferson finished third. He was third in the voting. Maybe he was second in the voting. Patrick Mahomes, Justin Jefferson, then Jalen Hurts. And then you're going to have both, in my opinion, should be at the end. Uh, but we'll see. But weirder things have happened. It, this is also a popularity contest sometimes, too. And Justin Jefferson is extremely popular. Other than, I would say, Patrick Mahomes, Justin Jefferson is a global athlete because now you have every sport in the country. You got people in the World Cup doing the gritty. So I think Justin Jefferson has it. Moving on to the next topic, what we got? Yeah, NBA draft last night, guys. We got to talk about this because I'm still scratching my head at how the Timberwolves moved up 20 spots. Uh, the, someone's got to check the Jimmy Johnson trade value chart because I'm not <laughs> sure the Spurs got good value here. A lot of people were probably in bed. It's like 1030 last night. Second round is about to start. And the Timberwolves go from 53 to 33 in exchange for a, a 2026 second round pick and a 2028 <laughs> second round pick. That's that's all it took. Wow. So the Wolves get, I think, a really intriguing player in Leonard Miller who is 6'10", 7-foot wingspan. Watch him, guys. He can finish in any contorting position around the rim. He's really physical around the basket. Uh, I love that he's a lefty because I'm a lefty. He's very silky. I think his shot motion is kind of weird. I think he's going to have to work on it, but his stats aren't bad, like 32% from three-point range. Uh, just an efficient scorer, but also a rim protector. He's got those long arms. There's a lot of chase down blocks. He protects the rim really nicely. So I, I love this pick. And then they kept 53. The Spurs couldn't even get 53 in that trade. So the Wolves got another guy, Jalen Clark, who's an absolute workhorse. You guys got to see his highlights. Super fast, super scrappy, defensive player of the year. This is Tim Connolly's wheelhouse, you guys, is drafting late round talent in the nba draft i think he's got two gems i love this draft brandon well, so to see them jump up to 33 you knew that Connolly had some sort of a draft crush and i think you hope that the guy on the back end jalen clark can maybe do like a, a jared vanderbilt impersonation which is kind of funny when you think about the picks the wolves traded and the players they traded to get rudy gobert but i i'm excited about leonard miller big numbers in the g league uh, you love those long athletic kind of just a you know defensive kind of guys but it's not just the the secondary aspects of the game he can score too you know he's going to scrap for loose balls he can do a lot of things and it'll be interesting to see how he fits into the rotation because I think at times last year I felt like Chris Finch had a lot of options and it was kind of hard to get consistent minutes for guys at different points in the season so I'll be curious to see 
first of all, where he fits in the rotation and then how quickly he gets into the rotation because, you know, it's hard to acclimate rookies, and that's especially true for second-round guys. Yeah, to Sam's point, this is Conley's wheelhouse. If any GM knows how to hit on one of these late-round picks, it might be Tim Conley, who's got the track record on his resume. Guys like Jokic, obviously. Even guys like Jaden McDaniels originally over there, too, before he got to Minnesota. So he's proven it's possible to find some steals in round two. And plus, even though they traded him away, he did nail the Walker Kessler pick last year, his mm-hmm. very first pick as a Wolves GM, too. So clearly this guy knows what to look for when you get later in the draft. So that's encouraging. The other thing, too, is with another trade up like that, I'm sure some fans were thinking, oh, my God, he's trading more future picks away. What are we doing? Well, don't forget the D'Lo Conley deal netted him three second rounders, remember? So even with the trade last night, he's still up one extra second rounder going into next year. So I thought all in all, he put on a little mini masterclass on draft protocol last night when it came to just knowing when to stay patient and then wheeling and dealing when the time was right to go get his guys. So that was nice to see. As far as the picks go, I'll echo what both of you guys said. I mean, Miller is about as big of a ball of raw, talented clay you're ever going to find that late in the draft. Youngest player in the class, only 19. Definitely a project. Just scratching the surface as far as physical and mental makeup. Um, But before the draft, I saw this guy as high as 13 on some people's boards. That's how much raw talent this kid has. And the comp I saw too last night, which should get Wolves fans pretty jacked up, Jaden McDaniels actually. So Mm. two, three, four years down the road, if they're able to develop his skill set, I think they got a huge steal at the top of round two. Yeah, I agree with that, Luke. When I look at this draft, I think the length, and we talked about this, if, you, if you're going to add something, uh, you need to add something to help out Anthony Edwards. This is what the team is about right now. As it stands right now, they still have Carl Anthony Towns, Rudy Gobert. So Carl Anthony Towns, as crazy as it might seem, he said we only have four to five months and the Nuggets have four to five years to do what they did. So maybe... Maybe they truly believe one full year plus an off season, and then we can get in here and do some things. You put another long body out there, which allows Carl Anthony Towns to be a stretch four when you have another guy uh, in Miller coming in to be a defender to help out the bigs. Here's some cool things, though. Amen and Oscar Thomas uh, Thompson, sorry, the twins, went four and five Rockets and Pistons. I thought that was cool. Here's another one for me. When you go down to the 53, and that was, I think Sammy had a great point, the fact they didn't have to give up 53 to move to 33. Jalen Clark out of UCLA, he was a top 40 prospect until he tore his Achilles. This pick right here is more of a pick and stash. See how he comes off injury. See if what he can be. But at 6'5", he was a legit defender. He was a legit defender. He was all defense in the in 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 the uh, NCAA, blah blah. Like the kid is really good, and he tore his Achilles towards the end of the year. So there's a kid that might have went, you know, forty or higher if he had not torn his Achilles. So I think the Timberwolves are getting him, hoping he can come back from that and be a true guard, wing, long, six five. Put him with with uh, Anthony Edwards. Have two long guards out there that can defend, but Anthony Edwards can be the scorer in the NBA nowadays. You don't need a true point guard anymore. We saw that with the, with the uh, with the Watt with the Warriors. They don't have a true point guard when they put Jordan Poole, Clay Thompson, and Steph Curry out there. Draymond Green brings the ball up. So I think there's Chris a thing. And also now. Chris Paul, yeah. Well, we'll see. Yeah. And then also you got a uh, uh I like Leonard uh Miller being from uh Canada. So maybe he'll give us a better Canadian feel than Wiggins did on his departure. Uh it's time to move on. What we got next? Oh, uh, <laughs> talk about Wiggins invoking the memory of Wiggins. That's a that's a sour note. But uh can we can we have some appreciation for Joe Ryan? Are you guys cool with that? We got uh, we got some numbers here. Let me hit you with some numbers because I'm a numbers guy. First Twins complete game in 1,841 days. Wow! You guys know where you were 1,841 days ago? Because I sure don't. I probably wow. didn't know where I was on that day. Uh, so Twins win 6-0. First complete game shutout for the Twins since the beginning of 2018. Our old friend Jose Barrios. And this is a big one. 83 strikes out of 112 pitches. So just nonstop pumping the zone with fastballs and splitters. That's the most strikes by a Twins pitcher since 2011 against the Dodgers. Scott Baker. I haven't talked about Scott Baker in so long, but 12 swings and misses on his four-seam fastball. Four-seam fastballs are not swing and miss pitches, but on this day they were. And let's not forget Boston, good offense, hits a lot of doubles. I think now we can question who's the who's the ace of this staff because you want your ace to be able to be a stopper. Twins on an absolute skid 
of late. They were uh, as far as two games under 500, stayed in first place. But we'll see if this is con- going to be a springboard for the Twins as they head into Detroit now, which is, you know, they're going to look for a measure of revenge after the Tigers kind of embarrassed them at Target Field last weekend. Yeah, Brandon had all the amazing stats. Absolutely wild. It's been that long since a complete game shutout. That's unbelievable for a couple different reasons, actually. But the pitching has always been the strong suit, and Ryan's always been one of their top two starters. So, uh, I mean, a huge breath of fresh air to see Rocco let a guy go the distance for once and just ride the hot hand. As far as the hitting goes, I think if it was just one guy starting to heat up, I would be far more skeptical. But to see three big names, Buxton, Correa, Kepler, go on a tear like they did, that gives me some hope that the guys they need to count on, the guy they need to carry the bats, could be finally starting to wake up. And they're just, I think they're just so desperate to finally have some consistency with the lineup. They really need those guys to get up, carry this momentum into this new series with Detroit if they want to be taken seriously and looked at as a complete team top to bottom for once. We've seen this before with Kepler, so I'm not holding my breath, but certainly is encouraging to see all three of these guys bust out in a big way like they have been lately. Yeah, I I didn't know if I would ever see a Twins complete game shutout again. I I didn't. I was was mourning it. Uh, Some of the best pitchers in the game today will never see the ninth inning because they're pulled so early. Like Think of all the things that have to happen in today's game for a pitcher to go all nine. You have to, you know, really, like Brandon said, you got to throw strikes. You can't go deep in counts. Uh, You can't even have too many strikeouts either because if you have too many strikeouts, it means you're throwing too many pitches uh, and you probably can't put a guy on there in the ninth. Like I think Rocco might have pulled him um, and put in Pagan, which people would have booed him for. Uh, There was absolutely no margin for error because he was working up to 112 pitches, but it went, it worked out great. Got some quick outs there in the ninth. And, and made it happen. Might be another five years, honestly, until we see it again. That is a once-in-a-blue-moon kind of event. Brandon, a quick follow-up on that? Yeah, so league-wide, only 12 nine-inning complete games this year. So it is it is a Twins thing, but it's also not a Twins thing. There's been 16 complete games. That includes shortened games for rainouts or, or you know what I mean, uh, eight-inning complete games when you lose as the visiting team. And so there have been 16 of those, but 12 that have gone all nine innings. So it's excessively rare as we're now two plus, almost three months into the season. Well, here's where I go with this. I'm wearing this shirt for a reason. I'm the Grinch. They beat the Red Sox. (laughs) They beat the Red Sox. So I got to bring the Grinch in this one. They beat the Red Sox. The Red Sox are 12 games back from the lead of the ALEs. The Red Sox have no chance of making the playoffs. The Red Sox are not our granddaddy's Red Sox who could beat the Yankees. This Red Sox team right now, they're okay. They're okay. So Joe Ryan, great job. I mean, I'm not going to hate on a, on a, on a no or a three hit a scoreless game. Great job. Making all the way through. Great job. Hopefully that gives them the, the, the confidence to go on and continue to do great things. Uh, because it's one of those things like when you beat the Packers and even though the Packers suck, you love beating the Packers. Uh, when you beat a team like the Bears, even though the Bears aren't great right now, you still feel like, you know what? We beat the Bears. Uh, when you beat the Steelers, uh, even though the Steelers aren't great right now, you feel like you beat. And so I think the Red Sox have that same, like it's the mystique of the Red Sox, but it's the Red Sox right now. They're 39 and 37, which is actually better than the Twins. And they're at the bottom of the ALEs, but the Twins, here's where I go with this. They're one game ahead. This is the stretch now. These are the games against the Tigers where I thought the they might lose the lead in the AL Central. The Tigers are 32 and 41. The Tigers can ruin the Twins weekend going into 4th of July if they find a way to knock them down a peg and win three games because I think the Guardians are going to get at least one in their next three. So this was the stretch I talked about a long time ago, and I hope they can prove me wrong. I hope they can beat my Tigers. But I don't know, man. The Tigers have the Twins number right now. They've, they've been doing pretty decent against them. But again, Maybe Joe Ryan's, you know, Gatorade water bath, you know, scoreless against the Red Sox might create some momentum for this team like Major League. Uh, We're going to talk about Dalvin Cook coming up because we got Dalvin Cook uh, and we got to talk about that. But before we jump into Dalvin Cook, we have a word from our sponsors. Yeah, thanks, Ron. Uh, We're brought to you today by FanDuel Sportsbook, and you can bet all the Major League Baseball action at FanDuel. It's money lines. It's run lines. I don't know. Those Twins unders, they, uh, they still are hitting a decent amount. Yesterday it would have hit. You can go check those out 
at FanDuel. You can get a no-sweat first bet if you're a new customer, up to $1,000 back in bonus bets. If your first bet doesn't win, up to $1,000 back in bonus bets. If that first bet doesn't win, they've got that and other great promotions going on all the time at the FanDuel Sportsbook, FanDuel Sportsbook app, and also FanDuel.com slash locked on, FanDuel.com slash locked on. You can make every moment more. And you can bet Major League Baseball. They're an official partner of FanDuel. Major League Baseball trademarks trademarks used with permission. Well, it's time to get back to Dalvin Cook, fellas. We, we've talked a lot this offseason about Dalvin Cook. Uh, I recently had um, Coach Chris Rump on. And, and Sam and I got a chance to chat with him. He, his episode is going to air next week. He already texted me last night. He's like, hey, man, w- w- when can I send that to my wife? She's got to hear hear this because uh, you, you did bring up a good point that I said I was wrong. And so I got to let my wife hear that one. So love, <laughs> Coach. He said anytime. So we're going to make sure we, we keep checking in with Coach Chris. Because, I mean, again, the, 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 the fact that he's with the D-line, Daniil Hunter, we got all these new guys, Dean Lowry, we had to do that. And so he brought up the fact that the team, they're creating a pitcher and they have to paint it. Right now, that painter has moved on from Dalvin Cook. But Dalvin Cook wanted to paint a picture for the world. And here's the exact quote. I'm not going to change it at all. He said, if I walk into a situation, it's going to be a situation where I can be helpful to somebody to go take the next step trying to get that Lombardi trophy. That's all I've got on my mind. The money is The money part is going to come. That's on my agent. Me, Dalvin Cook, I'm looking for somebody that's ready to win. I need to be a piece of a puzzle to help somebody turn the page to go win and turn that franchise to go get the Lombardi trophy. That's all I want. I want to hold that Lombardi trophy up, kiss it one time. That's all I'm looking for right now. And here's where I go with this. Great quote, great thought, but it's not going to work if you want to get paid. Those two things don't go together. I want to be paid and I want to go to a contender. The reason I said that, and and we all talked about it before, is the salary cap. The salary cap of teams that he could go to that could win a a, a Super Bowl. You got the Chiefs. They are very bottom. You got the Bills with his brother. Maybe. But they only have $5 in cap space. Uh, Maybe you can consider the Giants a contender because Saquon Barkley wants to leave if they don't pay him. Um, Other than that, I go up to like the 49ers with $10 My next one, maybe the Chargers with $12 million, the Eagles with $13 million, and the Dolphins with $13 million. Uh, you got the Bengals with $14 million. I'm going to go all the way up to the Jets. Jets with $23 million seems like the only team because you got the Bears, Cardinals, Panthers, Colts. Jets are the only team. He has to go play with Aaron Rodgers with the Jets if he wants to win a Super Bowl. They only have $23 million. I'm not sure they're going to give him an entire $23 million right now for this season. So what does he want? Is it 10 a year? Because he said four to five, four to $5 million is not what he wants. So I don't know what he wants. I don't know how much he wants to be paid. But if he wants 10 to $15 million a year, I don't know how many years he thinks that's going to get him and what he's worth off his injuries. But I, it's just a tough one. For me, he needs to take a pay cut and go play for the Jets and just go try to win in the next two years under Aaron Rodgers' tutelage and then maybe move on. The problem with moving on after that, though, is what's your value at that age? So the the two don't always add up. He's made $23 million over six years. Now, that's a lot of money. But to a guy who sees other guys living 50, 60, $7 million lives, I, I, it probably doesn't feel like a lot of money. And, and so for Dalvin Cook, wanting to get paid, but also wanting to win a Lombardi and kiss it, I thought the Minnesota Vikings was $17 million right now in cap straight. They've cleared. Not to say he would come back for cheaper, but maybe. Maybe the Dalvin Cook reunion might happen if nobody wants him. The Vikings are like, dude, we'll take you, but we're only going to give you 4 or $5 million like we talked about. And maybe that's why he threw that number out there. Maybe that was what the Vikings were trying to offer him to get him to take a pay cut at least for a year or two. And he didn't want to do it. We know Adam Thielen didn't want to be a, a, a what is it called, a decoy. So I don't know where we go from there. But what you got, Luke? Yeah, a lot of good points, Ron. I mean, this is not the offseason Dalvin was hoping for. He's starting to taste the hard reality of what being an NFL running back means now in the second half of your career in this new pass-happy league where even some of the, the best and biggest names get undervalued far more than they used to even just three, four years ago. I know he thinks he's going to come close to the $11 million he was lined up for this year, but I promise you he won't come close to that no matter who he signs with. I think his best bet, at this point, being so late in the offseason is just holding out, wait until maybe an injury happens during training camp or preseason to let him finally play with some leverage in these contract discussions. But end of the day, I got a hard time thinking he's going to take an extra 10 or 15% at most to go play for a team like Arizona or Houston versus going to play for a contender because 
I think the ballpark I'm looking at somewhere in that five to seven million at the most mm. per range is my guess. So do you want to play five with a contender or do you want to make seven with a below average team? I think the Broncos is the sneaky team here to think about. Russell Wilson, you got Sean Payton coming in. He's going to revamp the offense. But you still got the Dolphins and Jets as the favorites up on FanDuel.com. Yeah, I, I certainly think that you've pegged his value appropriately. About 5 to $7 million probably feels right. But let's remember that we see this all the time in the league. There are very creative ways to structure you can backload it. You can do void years. And, and there might be a way for a team to get Dalvin more guarantees down the road, but only keep his cap number at like $5 million this year. So th there, there could be a way where Dalvin sort of gets what he wants uh, and the teams can finagle the, the books with some accounting tricks and, and see that he gets a little bit more eventually. Um, but in general, guys... These running backs, they're not like other positions. They want to get paid in assurances right now because they know their careers are short. Someone like Daniil Hunter, he might be okay hitting free agency because he knows that he's going to get paid a lot of money. Dalvin Cook doesn't know that. He's one bad injury away from bottoming out his already decreasing value. So I get why he wants to sign this thing right now and make sure he gets that money while he's still relatively young because you get old fast when you're a running back. I keep coming back to a few things here. One is how much of this available cap space do teams want to spend on a running back too? And there are still some pretty good free agents available. And not only in general, but he's also competing for jobs with Ezekiel Elliott, Kareem Hunt, and Leonard Fournette. All those guys are older than him, but it's, it's all about fit too. So where are these guys all going to land? Will one or maybe two of them, have to be one of those in-season guys where the contract isn't guaranteed as a veteran and that sort of thing. So I, I come back to that. I also come back to, will his pride allow him to come back to Minnesota if the offers aren't there? And so it's it's hard once someone cuts you. I feel like and Ron would obviously know the ins and outs of the NFL better as far as if guys really feel hurt when they're cut and that sort of thing. But I feel like as much as it would be great to have him back in Minnesota, just because it'd be another option, it'd be another offensive weapon. Um, I don't know if I see it. I like that Broncos call though, because at this point you got to just kind of let Russ cook, give him as much as you can. They're they're They dove into the deep end of the pool with Russ and it's not a 10 foot pool. It's about a 50 foot pool. So that's what I like. I like that. And obviously the dolphins are the wild card here. Maybe not even the wild card, maybe the favorite based on, you know, his, uh, his ties to the area. I'm going to name some names. You guys just raise your hand. Uh, people listening, sorry, you won't be able to see the ha hands raised, but I'll make comments as they raise their hands. Raise your hand if you think Dalvin Cook is better than this back, and then I'm going to explain this. So just raise your hand. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to give cues to the people listening on the uh, on the, the pod. For those watching on uh, on uh, YouTube, and more reason for you people who are listening right now, go to the YouTube. You'll get to see us raise our hands and understand what this topic is about. But raise your hand if you think Dalvin Cook is better than this one. One last one before we get out of here. Christian McCaffrey, Alvin Kamara, Derrick Henry, Nick Chubb, Joe Mixon, Mm, I I put a hand up there. Okay, we got three hands up for Joe Mixon. Aaron Jones. We got one hand up with Luke. Uh, Tony Pollard. Oh, healthy Tony Pollard. Healthy Tony Pollard. I can't do it. Josh Jacobs. Saquon Barkley. James Connor. Oh, two I'd for have the to look at the Connor okay, stats. three for the Connor. Yeah. Uh, Miles yeah. Sanders. Two. Austin Eckler. Hmm. Mm. David Montgomery. Three. Bijan Robinson. Ooh. Are, are we talking about building a team from No, just, just I'm just asking if you think better. Bijan Robinson. One game. I'm taking the young guy. Okay. Uh, so here's where I go with this. Legs. I got all the way down to five million dollars a year. You guys only pick two guys that Dalvin Cook might be better than. And none of those guys make more than $7 million. So we know Dalvin Cook thinks he should be paid maybe like a Derrick Henry, like a Nick Chubb. These guys are at 16, 15, 12 million dollars a year, 11. So that gives you guys an idea, people at home, of what Dalvin Cook wants. He does want something like that. He wants like a $10 million a year contract. But Luke, you hit the nail on the head. He's about a $7 million guy. 
Alexander Madison is three and a half million. So when you think about what you, who do you think he's better than? And, and, and again, it's all relative to the offense, to what they're going to do. Is it going to be a screen game offense? Is it going to be a ground and pound offense? Uh, what type of line do they have? But at the end of the day, value versus what you're going to get from him. Value versus what you're going to get from him. How much do I want to pay and what am I going to get? It's going to be tough for Dalvin Cook. The only teams on this list that don't have a running back even on here are the Jets. The Jets are all the way down to Brees Hall at $2.2 million. I think Brees Hall and, and Dalvin Cook together with the Jets and Aaron Rodgers Seems like a good marriage, but maybe Dalvin Cook's asking for too much. But if he wants to be a contender, I'm gonna I'm gonna say, hey, look, I'll take six million, seven million, and go be with the Jets. I mean, why not air contender? Uh, but yeah, Brandon, what you got? Yeah, I mean, pairing him up with a guy who's coming off an injury and on a rookie contract with the Jets, I think is is probably the best fit. It's I think that's a great idea. Yeah, it just it just seems like it fits to me. And again, I just I just had to get the number. I wanted to see where you guys were at from your like, what would you do? Because I don't know. I mean, I I look at that list and I kind of want to throw him up there in that top seven, but I just don't know. Like, I, I do think Dalvin Cook's better than some of those other guys I named. Um, but it, it's it's a tough one. Like like Derrick Henry to me, he doesn't give you what Dalvin Cook gives you. So is Dalvin Cook worth twelve and a half? I think so because he Derrick Henry can't do the screen game stuff Dalvin can and run routes outside. Alvin Kamara is a different beast. Christian McGavage is a different beast. But I feel like Dalvin Cook should be up there in the top five. But then is it top five money, though? And that's the question. But before we get on to Taylor Swift, because Taylor Swift's coming to the Minneapolis, $5,500 is one of her tickets if you want to go see it. I'm not spending $5,500 on T-Swift, but some of you might because you're a Swifty. We know Sam's a Swifty. But before we jump into the Taylor Swift song, fun before we get out of here, Sirius XM is a proud partner with Locked On. The Twins hit the road to face the Detroit Lions. No, sorry, it's the Detroit Tigers at 5.40 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> I wish they were playing the Lions. They'd have a better yeah. chance of winning. Well, uh, but you can go grab every pitch of the Twins' hometown broadcast with Sirius XM on the S. XM app just search twins and hopefully they can beat the Tigers two out of the three at least early and then maybe make the Guardians second guess if they can actually take this lead but one game is not enough to have a lead it's early in the season it's a lot of baseball left so we'll see this roller coaster ride that the twins are going to put us on like all Minnesota sports do we're going to have to sit and wait just like the twin Timberwolves in the playing game but fellas, have a little fun one. Taylor Swift's tickets. I saw prices right now, 3300 4300 5500 if you want to go to her concert, depending on where you want to sit. Um, I will go for the Twitter uh, because I know everybody's going to pull their phones out and videotape every moment of it because they're idiots and they paid and they're going to show us for free what they're seeing and they pay 5500 bucks for you, idiot. Oh, I'm sorry, you're not an idiot. Uh, you're just unaware of the fact of just enjoy the concert. Don't yep. stream it for us. We don't really care. And we can't even really hear it. It's just you moving up and down and people sweaty and whatever. But if you guys were to pick Taylor Swift songs, starting with you, Luke, what's your favorite T-Swift song? Oh, man, I'm such an old man now. I, I just plug in one of the same three, four podcasts in the rotation. I'm that guy. H having said that, I guess the T-Swift I remember back in the day, the OG stuff, I'd have to go with... I knew you were trouble or you belong with me. I'm a Never sucker for it. the old classics. Me and I T mean, Swift songs are like salmon movies. Never heard of it. What you got next, yeah. Sam? Yeah, no, it's nice to be on the other side of this for once. Um, there, there's two types of T Swift songs. You know, there's the there's the albums like Evermore and Folklore, which you put on when you're working and they just carry you away. And they're like a beautiful <laughs> soundtrack just sweeping over you. But I don't know if any of those individual songs really grab me, like some of her pop hits, uh, which I really get into. I mean, recency bias, Antihero is one of the best songs ever written. When my depression works the graveyard shift, all of the people I've ghosted stand there in the room. Uh, gorgeous writing, Taylor. Uh, my, my kind of pet favorite, Calm Down from back in the day. Calm Down, great beat. Uh, my kids love it. Could listen to it all day. T Swift, not going to your concert, but wish I was. Uh, any free tickets anybody has, send them my way. Yeah, for me, I'm going with a staple radio staple. Shake it off. I thought Matt. I thought uh, Sam yes. was waxing. Po I thought Sam was waxing poetic when he was reading those lyrics. Yeah, like uh, <laughs> like that James was where Joyce? he goes. With what it. was that? Beautiful. <laughs> Yeah, that James was great. Um, I was going to say shake it off. I was going to say thank you next, and then I realized that's Ariana Grande. So <laughs> Don't get me started on Ariana. That's like a whole new level of, of fanboy right there. You could be like Michael Scott, though, where your favorite songs 
by Bruce Springsteen are all different art uh, artists, <laughs> like Huey Lewis in the news and that sort of thing. So like, I make sure. Hey, you let me right let me ask you guys real quick. Have you guys seen a concert at U.S. Bank? By the way, if so, who no. was it? How was it? Because no. I heard a lot of negative reviews about the acoustics. But we just saw mm -hmm. Red Hot Chili Peppers like two months ago, first concert there. Granted, we were on the floor, but they killed it, man. It sounded great. I've probably seen twenty concerts in my life. I'm putting that in the top five. It was outstanding. Never heard of it. Never. I mean, sorry, never heard of a concert there. Uh, I will say the ghost of Justin Jefferson and Kirk Cousins will be in there. That fourth down pass by Kirk Cousins against the Giants is still in there. So maybe T Swift could get the ghost out. But if she wants to win the crowd over, she doesn't have to do anything, but she would go super viral if she were to gritty. I don't know if she can gritty, but T Swift should definitely come out like on I don't know what song. Either she should gritty or she should have had her people reach out to Justin Jefferson and say, hey. I don't know if you want to get paid or if you'll just do this for free, but can you come up, show up, and then gritty to one of my songs down the stage? Like that would oh, shut down. That would like that would shut the internet dirty. down. Oh, if Justin Jefferson were I bet gritty the Vikings with might have filmed something or packaged something during <laughs> mini on the screen. When he was there. Yeah, put it yeah. on the big screen. That they could definitely have done that. Yeah, maybe. But listen, maybe. If if Mike Gesicki can try the gritty, Taylor Swift can do it. <laughs> And she has more rhythm, though. Taylor True. Swift can actually dance. Right. Like, I've seen her dance to, like, hip-hop stuff. So she can actually dance. Um, so, yeah, I would like to see her gritty, though. Like, that that would shut the internet down. T-Swift grittying or Justin Jefferson with T-Swift grittying. Like, that would be, oh, my goodness, that would be ridiculous. And then, of course, you know, the dude that actually created the dance and he's going to want credit for it. Like, he's going to be tweeting out, like, oh, I should have been there, too. Like, T-Swift, let me come to the next concert. Like, no, bro. Like, no, 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 no. Nah, no. Bro. I don't know if you guys ever seen him. He was with Justin Jefferson. Justin Jefferson and him had never met, I found out, too. Him and Justin Jefferson, he met, they met for the first time at one of the games. It yeah. was very awkward because he came over to Justin Jefferson's, like, warm-ups, and he's trying to get Justin Jefferson to gritty with him because he wants to, you know, he wants to videotape it for his social media. And uh, he's, like, dudes doing a gritty on the sideline with Justin Jefferson, like, standing there kind of doing a gritty, and then they laugh, and Justin Jefferson runs off to warm up. I'm like, that was awkward. Like, just shake his hand and be like, man, appreciate all you do. Uh, thanks for making me famous. All right, go go win this game. Like, it was just super awkward. But my last one before we get out of here, my T-Swift story. I don't know if I ever told you guys this. Did I ever tell you guys this about when she gave me a guitar? What? With her teardrops on it? I never told you that? Yeah. So Stop. this was, uh, I don't know what year this was. It was before I had kids. Like, right before I had kids. I think my wife might have been pregnant even. So this would have been like 2009, 2010, or 2008, 2009. Uh I went to a, I was I was working for Best Buy so they took all the managers on this like trip and we went on this trip and uh our guest was Taylor Swift because she had this is when she was young cuz I don't even remember this but I don't know if you guys remember the Nokia phone Taylor Swift like put all her music from this album into this phone and then that's what like they had a ton of girls buying the phone because they can get her album for mm -hmm. free if they bought the phone and activate it on Verizon or whatever Preloaded. I think yeah. yeah I think like T-Mobile Sprint Verizon everybody had AT&T and so Best Buy was the partner that was partnering with T-Swift to sell them. So we had like this big like deal with Taylor Swift, this big launch, this unveiling, and she comes up and it's a karaoke contest. And so, of course, I've been drinking because I'm like, there's no way I can do karaoke without drinking. So I started, you know, drinking and they're like, oh, man, you should because I was dressed like Kanye. It was a costume contest. So I was dressed like Kanye. They're like, dude, you should grab the microphone from somebody and just say Beyonce had the best album ever and then start doing oh, the Kanye song. No way. And I was I was like, no, I'm not doing that, man. I no Taylor Swift event. Like, I can't do this. And they're like, dude, do it. She she'll think it's funny. So I did it, did the gold digger song. They had all these like fake Taylor Swift lookalike star walking behind me during the during the uh, gold digger. Like, I didn't know they were gonna do that too. Like they sent all these fake uh uh Taylor Swift lookalikes on stage behind me, did the whole song. Walked off stage. Everybody loved it. Blah, blah. Like 30 minutes later, somebody comes and grabs me from Best Buy higher up. I'm thinking I'm in trouble because I'm like, oh, man, because I know like the, the Gold Digger song has a little bit of cursing in it. And, you know, mm -hmm. so I didn't know what was about to happen. And I know I, I like I snatched the mic from the lady doing the uh, intros. And, so and like, Best Buy corporate, they don't mess around. Exactly. <laughs> All of a sudden they bring me to like the basement. I'm like, oh, OK, it's over. I'm oh, fired. I'm fired. Get roughed up. It was Taylor Swift's manager. He was down there. She had autographed a, a guitar and was like, hey, can you give it to the guy that did the uh, Gold Digger song? Are you Kanye? talking about a real guitar? Oh, yeah. It was an actual guitar. She signed it. you still it. have it? See, this is the story. When my daughter was born, me and my wife were thinking about it. It was like, oh, we should, we should keep the guitar and maybe put it in her room or something or something like that. I didn't know who the hell Taylor Swift was. I'm not going to lie. I didn't really know who she was. I wasn't into her music. Uh, I know she is now, and I still don't know what I would do with it. And I sold it on eBay. I sold it on eBay. I got to go buy my eBay account. I think I sold it for like 2,500 bucks. That thing probably now is worth like 25 grand. Um, but yeah, I sold it for like 2,500 bucks because I was like, 
I don't want this guitar. What am I doing with a pink and white guitar with Taylor Swift's face on it and her autograph? Like, I'm like, what literally am I going to do with this? And I just did not think about the long-term value of it. I didn't hold on to it. It was one of her actual guitars and she signed it. And uh, yeah, it probably is worth maybe more than that. Who knows? I probably can get a Swifty to pay a hundred grand for an autograph Taylor Swift yeah. guitar. Who knows? But yeah, I get it though. At the time, you're trying short term to, money versus long term investment. Yeah. I, yeah. Yep, I ran Who away knows? from the T Swift. Uh, the, 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 the craze that is T Swift. I did not yeah. know. I apologize. I might have to do a testimony Tuesday to T Swift after this concert. Is a concert this weekend? It's tonight, yeah, tonight and tomorrow. Okay, so I maybe yeah. maybe my testimony Tuesday to start off the show Tuesday. Uh, I have to do that, but make sure you guys check out this week. We have a loaded guest. We have Don Terrius Thomas, who still owes Brandon Warren the autograph football, and Brandon Warren is not happy with that. So Don Terrius Thomas, and 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 when we tweet out the link, we'll we'll make sure to tag Don Terrius or Brandon. Make sure you tweet at Don Terrius. You say, hey man, great interview. You still owe me a football from you and AP. Uh, we have Coach Chris Rump, D line coach, uh, Daniel Hunter's uh, coach. So he's going to join us on the on locked on. And then we have Julia Daniels from Care 11. She's going to join us. She's kind of a Josh Dumal fan. So hear about what she would bet if Josh Dumal would ask her. Got real interesting there. Um, but I'm Ron Johnson. That's Sam Ekstrom. That's Luke Spinman or Inman for those that know him. And then that's Brandon Warren from Locked On Twins. We want to thank you guys. Have a great Friday. Have a great weekend. And you got one week. And this is the 4th of July. Be safe, though. Don't light fireworks next to gasoline. It never never turns out well for those. Uh, I want to thank you guys. Please subscribe. Locked on Sports Minnesota on Amazon Fire, Roku, uh, iHeartMedia, iTunes, Spotify. Wherever you get your iTunes, we don't care. But just subscribe to the Locked On Sports Minnesota podcast and the Locked On Twins. All the Locked On Sports in Minnesota. Please check it out and have a great day.